Today we're going to be talking about Unit 2, General Safety Rules. This is something that we've covered quite a bit uh, throughout the class and something that I reinforce on a consistent basis. Um, the phrase I like to use a lot is safety as a lifestyle. And that means that um, you are expected to observe safe practices at all times for yourself and be aware of your surroundings that other people might not be observing these safe practices and that they can catch you up in what they're actually doing. So um, what I would like to talk about now is go through the general safety rules area. Good carpenters recognize that safety is an important part of the job. They know that accidents can occur easily in building construction and that they often result in partial or total disability. Even minor cuts or bruises can be painful. So even in that short first paragraph, uh, we we hear something that's very, um, very real. You can have a life-altering injury and that will end your construction career. Uh, if the injury is severe enough, you will be on permanent disability uh, for the rest of your life. So you need to really envision what it's gonna take to do whatever your objective is safely. Think about setting yourself up for success. Uh, for instance, on a roof, depending on the pitch of the roof, the incline, the incline you're gonna need to take precautions about having a rope to secure yourself because if you start sliding and the pitch is too steep, you'll just completely slide off of the roof. And then depending on how many stories the house is, you'll have a long fall down. Now, um, just to be clear, these uh, stories are not meant to scare you, but to be very real and bring some realness into this textbook context because you need to think about what it's going to take to do your job in the long term. Uh, what about a small injury? A small injury might require physical therapy. You might be on workman's comp for a little while. Uh, your employer will pay for that. Technically, you've paid for that by working uh, for the business. Um, and then over time, you rehabilitate that particular injury. Um, so let's continue. Safety is based on knowledge, skill, and attitude of care and concern. Carpenters should know correct and proper procedures to performing the work. They should also be familiar with potential hazards, how they can be minimized or eliminated. Good attitudes towards safety are important. This includes belief in the importance of safety and willingness to give time and effort to continuous study of the safest ways to perform work. It means working carefully and following the rules. Uh, so to summarize that, identifying where there could be some hazards before you even get started is very important. And that is a way that we'll approach this topic. Next area, decks and floors. To perform an operation safely, either with hand or power tools, the carpenter should stand on firm soft, solid base, on a firm solid base. The surface should be smooth but not slippery. Do not attempt to work over rough piles of earth or on stacks of material that are unstable. Stay well away from floor openings, floor edges, and excavations as much as possible. Where this cannot be done, installing adequate guardrails or barricades is important. In cold weather, remove ice or cover it with sand or calcium chloride, also known as salt. Next section, excavations. Short and adequate bracing must be placed across the face of any excavation where the ground is cracked or caving in, it, uh, caving is likely to occur. Inspect the excavation and 
shoring daily, especially after rain. Follow state and local regulations. Never climb into an open trench until proper reinforcements of in, against cave-ins has been installed or until the sides have been sloped to the angle of repose of the material being excavated. Before beginning excavations, determine whether there are underground utilities in the area. If so, locate and arrange protection for them during excavation operations. Excavated soil and rock must be stored at least two feet away from the edge of an excavation. Using ladders or steps to enter trenches, oh, use ladders or steps to enter trenches which are more than four feet deep. Um, excavations, uh, I wanted to just mention if you're trenching or you're digging these large uh, style trenches, uh, you can be sure that there's some type of medium to heavy equipment around. Be mindful that the operator of the equipment might not be able to react very quickly to something fast. Um, Get it getting in their way so make sure that you communicate very well with the machine operator when people are coming and going out of the area with heavy machinery and you also want to wear uh, perhaps uh, your safety equipment it might include a vest a reflective vest that really lets the heavy equipment or medium equipment operator know where you are all at all times just through the peripheral vision, they can really just know where you're at without even looking up from what they're doing because um, that's the way that you can be the safest in the proximity of medium to heavy equipment. Scaffolds and ladders. Scaffolds should have a minimum safety factor of four. This means that the scaffold will carry a load four times greater than the maximum load that it will be required to support. All scaffolding should be constructed under the direction of an experienced carpenter. Inspection should be made daily before use. Ah, this is interesting. Uh, scaffolding uh, may be built on site, and that's what this is in reference to, but uh, many, uh, in many cases, um, I have seen people rent scaffolding uh, and rent large amounts of this scaffolding. Uh, the scaffolding is usually made out of metal and those metals have lots of cross beams and supports uh, so that you don't um, fall off or they don't become unstable. They also have leveling jacks on the bottom of their feet so that you can make sure that they're completely level. As you build up from the bottom, you want to be completely level because otherwise you'll be building it at an angle and eventually it will um, have a tendency to lean or you'll uh, or your tools will even if it's slightly unlevel your tools might roll off if you place your tools down and they they are round type tools uh, so be mindful when you're using scaffolding uh, another important uh, safety factor in using scaffolding is if there's a way to tie it onto the building as you're going up if there's a way to secure it either through a window or through uh, some type of bolting to the actual facial pieces of the building, that's also recommended. The scaffolding could potentially fall away from the building. So making sure that while you're working on it, it's in a secure uh, position is very important. Next section, falling objects. When working on upper levels of a structure, you should be especially cautious in handling tools and materials, so there is no chance of them falling on workers below. Do not place tools on the edge of scaffolds, step ladders, window sills, or any other surface where they might be knocked off. If long pieces of lumber must be placed temporarily on the end and leaned against the side of the structure, be sure that they will not fall sideways. When moving through a building under construction, be aware of overhead work. 
and whenever possible, avoid passing directly underneath. Stay clear of materials being hoisted. Wear an appropriate hard hat whenever there is a possibility of falling objects. Incidentally, I just ordered several hard hats so that we can practice with those as proper personal protective equipment. Next section. Handling hazardous materials. Pressure treated wood because of chemical preservatives used requires special care and handling for safety of the construction worker. Avoid prolonged breathing of sawdust particles. Sawing should be done outdoors while wearing a dust mask. Wear safety goggles when power sawing or machining. Before eating any food, carefully wash any skin that has come into contact with the pressure treated wood. Clothing soiled by contact with the pressure treated wood should be laundered before reuse. The clothing should be washed separately from other clothing. When handled this way, treated wood does not pose a health hazard. Never burn scraps of treated wood, rather bury them or place them in an ordinary trash collection bin or dumpster placed on site during construction. Use great care when spraying paints, use an appropriate respirator and protect exposed skin by covering it with clothing. I wanna go back to the pressure treated wood um, item. It is very toxic. I would recommend you wear gloves completely over both of your hands. Make sure you always wear eye protection and a respirator is mandatory. Pressure treated wood is poisonous. And when we create this dust from the poison, it is easily inhaled into our lungs. We want to avoid that at all costs. That's why using pressure treated uh, wood is only allowed on the exterior of homes. It is absolutely never ever allowed to be used on the inside of homes. Even your proximity to it, if it was used inside, could make you sick. Meaning, if you put pressure treated wood into this wall that's behind this sheetrock, you could, in fact, still be getting chemically influenced by the wood's toxicity. It is for that reason that you must always take special care with using, when using, cutting, or manipulating pressure treated wood and definitely uh, any chemicals that you might encounter on your job all have instructions in case you become injured with those chemicals you want to flip around the bottle and you want to look at what's going on uh, as opposed to first aid they'll tell you what you should do flush with warm water flush with cold water there's different things for different chemicals so make sure that you are aware of what you might need to do if you have some type of complication when using chemicals on your job. Next area, lifting and carrying. Injuries may be caused by improper lifting or carrying heavy objects. When lifting, stand close to the load, bend your knees and grab the object firmly. Then lift by straightening your legs and keeping your body as close to vertical as possible. To lower the object, reverse the procedure. Uh, this is definitely a lift with your legs, not with your back uh, example. Hmm. Let's see if I can demonstrate what that looks like. If I'm gonna be picking up an object, I would bend my knees, and then squat down, grab the object, pull, pulling the object close to me, then I would stand straight up while keeping my back straight. It's very important you don't try to lift it with your back this way. That's definitely going to lead to an injury. So remember, again, the proper way is to bend your knees, grab the object, Pull the object close, get a nice grip on it, however you need to, and then come up straight. If you're gonna be doing some heavy lifting, I really recommend 
that you start to stretch. You do a lot of stretches just like you do uh, in PE class to get ready before you go on a run. It's the same in construction. Stretch out your back, stretch out your legs, stretch out your arms, your neck, and everything. Get really ready to do that heavy activity. When carrying a heavy load, do not twist your body, but make adjustments in position by shifting your feet. If the load is heavy or bulky, have others help. I definitely want to emphasize that. Ask other people for help whenever you're carrying something really heavy, because it will always be better to have somebody else help you rather than to drop the item or to perhaps drop the item on yourself, injuring yourself. So you wanna be very careful about that. Never underestimate the weight to be moved or overestimate your own ability. Always have assistance when carrying longer pieces of lumber. Next section, fire protection. Carpenters should have a good understanding of fire hazards. They should know the causes of fires and methods of controlling fires. Class A fires result from burning wood and debris. Class B fires involve highly volatile materials such as gasoline, oil, paints, and oil-soaked rags. Class C fires are caused by electrical wiring and equipment. Any of these fires can occur on a typical construction site. Approved fire pre prevention practices should be followed throughout, throughout the construction project. Good housekeeping is an important aspect. Special precautions should be taking dur taken during the final stages of construction when heating and wiring have been installed and when highly flammable surface finishes are being applied. Always keep containers of volatile materials closed when not in use. Dispo dispose of oily rags and combustible materials promptly. That means as soon as possible. Fire extinguishers should be available on the construction site. Be sure to use the proper kind of fire extinguisher for each type of fire. Next and final section, first aid. A knowledge of first aid is important. You should understand approved procedures and be able to exercise good judgment in applying them. Remember that an accident victim may receive an additional injury from unskilled treatment. Information of this nature can be secured from your local Red Cross. As a preventative measure against infection, keep an approved first aid kit on the job site. Because of the nature of the material being handled and the dirty conditions of the work area, even superficial wounds should be treated promptly. Clean, sterilize, and bandage all cuts and nicks. This concludes Unit 2. I hope you've enjoyed our time together today. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye.